Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinges catches the last blooms on an Oklahoma-proven chase tree. At the Cimarron Valley Research Station in Perkins, Oklahoma, OSU turf grass specialist Justin Moss shows us the start of a new Bermuda grass removal study. We visit a lovely cottage garden shed in Enid made for crafting and fun, and an innovative garden shed and more that takes advantage of a small space. And back home at our garden, we unravel the mystery of the tiger stripes in our lawn. fairly large ornamental plant to add into your garden, you might look at adding the chase tree. Now this is a multi-stem shrub or it can be trained up into a small tree, but you can see the ornamental features it adds with this um, beautiful spike of purple or blue flowers. It also comes in a pink and even a white uh, flowering variety. They get to be about 20 feet tall, but there are some cultivars that stay relatively smaller. They have a palmate leaf that you can see that has a nice kind of greenish bluish color to it with a, a pink midrib. In addition to the name chase tree, it also has the names monk's pepper. And you can see the seeds kind of have the peppercorn look to them as they start to uh, turn and get even darker black as they fall. Now sometimes they can be a reseeding problem, so you might be aware of that. The lure behind this, being called chase tree or monk's pepper, is that it is an anaphrodisiac, meaning it tends to have more of a calming effect. At least that's what they claim. Now that's never been backed up by research and we wouldn't recommend it. But it's needless to say, it's a nice ornamental tree to add into your garden. Today we're at the home of Gail and John Wynn outside of Enid, Oklahoma, and you would think we're at the Cape, really. I mean, this home is just beautiful. Thank you. Um, there's not a lot of Cape-style homes around this not area. Not a lot. We were fortunate to get one. We like Cape Cod style, so yeah, we yeah. were pleased so, to get one. Tell me a little bit about how that influenced your garden here. I mean, your garden's just beautiful. Well, it happens that I like cottage-style gardens anyway. And we had actually visited Martha's Vineyard a few years before we bought this house, and I bought a book about all the gardens and homes of Cape Cod. And so I like the pinks and the purples and the yellows and the whites, and that fits perfectly into a cottage garden. I like perennials. And, um, and then there's also a lot of self-seeding annuals in this garden. Right, so you've got some poppies that I see are going to seed they there. They are going to seed. They bloomed in May. Mm -hmm. And the thing about using a lot of self-seeding annuals is you have to be willing to look at the drying out plant so that it can go to seed and reseed for the next year. But they're kind of architectural and fun in their, in their own way. Yeah, they're very ornamental. So I, did, I had larks, a lot of larkspur, there's a little left and poppies. Next will come Xenia, Cosmos, and Cleome. Okay. And then in the fall, it'll be riddled with uh, coxcomb. And of course, everywhere. the verbena, I know, will reseed all over <coughs> it does. too. So, and it yeah. has, yes. Yeah. Well, you have definitely have pulled it off with the, the yellows and the whites <laughs> and the pinks. I just love it. And the texture too. There's a lot of uh, ornamental texture in this. What really brought us to your garden though, I mean, this was a pleasant surprise by all <laughs> means, but what really brought us was the shed competition. That's true. Yes. So this is your garden shed from the outside it and it is unlike any garden shed that I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I call it my garden house. Yeah. So it's a little, a little bit it's of a miniature. It's definitely more than a shed. <laughs> <laughs> it's a miniature. I, uh, we built it in 2007 and my husband designed it 
to make sure that it was a scale to our two-story house. Okay. Um, and then he did the outside and all the frill part. He loves to do that. Uh -huh. And I figured out what I wanted on the inside. Okay. So it was a joint effort of both of us. Well, the outside looks beautiful. I love the arbor over it mm -hmm. and, and the octagon windows in there, the hexagon windows, the hexagon I should window. say. Mm -hmm. um, let's go in inside let's and see what your work has done. This is just lovely, gal. Thank you. Thank you. So, I first noticed the pegboard. Mm -hmm. I got to talk about this pegboard. I love how it's so functional, I guess, but it's also it just kind of classy, too. Well, thank you. I've never really thought of it as classy. <laughs> I just wanted to be able to move stuff around because yeah. at different times of the year, I do different things in here. Like, now I'll start hanging poppies to drop seed or okay. to gather the seeds. And so I dry things in here. I dry herbs also. So okay. um, I wanted to be able to move the walls around without making a lot of holes in them. So they already have holes. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just so unified that you don't even, it just kind of mm -hmm. goes into the background a little bit. It does. But yet it's functional. Mm -hmm. So, so let's, let's talk a little bit about how you decorate. I have a feeling some of these things are kind of personal they mementos <laughs> to you. Yeah. Um, you've got beautiful furniture in here, and is this a potting table? That's my potting bench. Oh my mm -hmm. gosh, it's beautiful. They were actually made by a man from Weatherford who uh, was a math professor at Southwestern, mm -hmm. and he um, he made the potting bench and both of the cupboards. Okay. And then he came back in, and I had purchased that from a, a just a box store, and he roughed up my um, sink area to look oh, okay. to, to match, match the rest this. of the furniture. He would go around and collect things from old homes. Oh, okay. And um, put the pieces together into whatever you wanted. And uh, you've got your little hole, hole. here for your <laughs> debris and right. that sort My of stuff. Right, my potting soil yeah. underneath yeah. and scrape it back in. So yeah. is there a story behind the brand here? That's, and... that's my family's brand, Bellman. Oh, okay. My dad was Henry Bellman, and he um, drew the brand one night. I uh -huh. remembered him doing it. And it's been registered for probably 50 years. Wow. So, and, then my, and the stained glass was done by my mother. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. So you've got a lot of mementos from your dad. So I do. We've got your license plates up mm -hmm. here. And how old were you when he was governor? Um, I had just turned 12 the okay. first time. Right. And so then, you got to experience the mm -hmm. governor's mansion and everything? We did. And mm -hmm. then I, he was then elected 24 years later. So I went back with my family, which was fun. <laughs> which I was bet. Fun. So I, I'm drawn to your seed collection over here. This is just, <laughs> I have a hard a time throwing things away, <laughs> as you can tell. No wonder your garden looks so good. I mean, you're well, really collecting. Well, it's amazing what a garden produces, mm -hmm. uh, a flower garden. Lots of seed, um, lots of babies. I have baby coneflower popping up everywhere out oh, there. Yeah. Um, and so I started just saving seeds and collecting them. And then I started borrowing seeds from other gardens I might visit. And um, so somehow they get in your pocket. Somehow they <laughs> land in your pocket. Poppies are especially good at that. So I, um, I decided I wanted to just have them out. So if people wanted seeds when they came by, I could give them to them. Or if like this year, the larkspur didn't really dry out. It okay. was so wet, it just kind of disintegrated. Yeah. So I'm going to take some of the larkspur seed and spread it in my garden just to make sure I have larkspur next yeah, year. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful plant. This is a chicken nest that I gathered eggs from as a child. Okay. We had a big um, chicken house, and my mother had an egg business. So we would gather the eggs and wash them and candle them and box them up. And she would drive over to Enid and sell them to different restaurants and hospitals. Wow. In the, this is 1950s. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's so great that mm -hmm. it's still part of your family it here is. and everything. I love having So it what was kind of the plan when you were building this, this garden shed? <laughs> <laughs> uh, as a child, um, my grandmother had 10 grandchildren, six of them were girls, uh -huh. and we would all gather at her house to play, and she turned her wash house over to us, and we had to drive up a window, and my grandfather would pull out a stock tank and we had to use it for our swimming pool we just had the best time at my grandmother's house so i wanted a place like that to use for gardening of course but uh -huh. also to share with my grandchildren yeah so and the, do they get to come they, and enjoy they it do here? come and enjoy it yeah and, and neighborhood children come and enjoy it well and i almost feel like i'm in a tree house because we've got so many windows <laughs> and we're looking out and we just see a lot of trees and branches and your your lovely garden of course well, and yeah. It's just really nice. But this is actually a functioning shed, too. I mean, it's beautiful. It is. But I've got to peek around here <laughs> because you really have your lawnmowers and your weed eaters and that sort of stuff mm -hmm. back there. Everything is there. Yeah, it, we use it every day during yeah. the growing season. 
and a lot of times in the winter, I like to write, so I'll come out here to write sometimes because okay. it's quiet and yeah. away from everything. Yeah, and you got a nice fan to keep it cool in here for <laughs> you. So do you also um, do some flower arranging? Because I'm seeing a lot of baskets and, and wire Vases. and stuff like that. Vases, yeah. Mm -hmm. I do. Um, I make arrangements for our church every week during the growing season, and um, I do... For, I'm involved with a food pantry here called Loaves and Fishes, a client choice food pantry. And I take an arrangement there every week so the clients have something cheery when they when they come in. And lots of friends and, a, and occasionally a small wedding. So right. I do like to arrange flowers. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to do when you just can go out and pick any, you know, just keep picking until it looks good. Yeah, and with <laughs> that much of a garden out there, you've got plenty Plen of flowers to choose to from. from. Yes, yeah, I definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, I love your shed, and I love how you've customized it with really personal, I mean, you've even got some photos of your dad when he was younger mm -hmm. up here, and, and your 4-H yeah, garden uh -huh. project. And Everybody's grown zinnias in a tire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a classic, right? Yes. <laughs> For Oklahoma. But it's just really beautiful, and, and again, the pegboard, being able to really see all of your tools, it having is. it out, no where to grab it and that sort of stuff. On any size garden shed, I think it's great. I, if anybody comes in and says, I'm building a shed, can I look at yours? I say the first thing is line it with pegboard. That's it. It really, it makes everything so handy. That's a great tip. Thank you for sharing <laughs> well, this thanks garden for coming. shed. I really appreciate it. We're here at the Cimarron Valley Research Station in Perkins, and joining us today is Dr. Justin Moss, who's our turf grass specialist. A couple of months ago, I approached Dr. Moss for a simple demonstration. I asked if he had some grass for us to kill to demonstrate solarization and the effects that it creates on our turf grass. And what I've learned is when you ask a researcher a simple question, you don't often get a simple answer. Instead, you get something like this. So, Dr. Moss, we're killing grass here, it looks like, definitely. Can you tell us a little bit about all the trials and this particular research project that we started here? Sure, so this is just a big area of Bermuda grass, and what we've done is we come in here and taken your simple idea <laughs> and turned it into, oh, about 30 treatments and three replications and 90 total plots out here. So this is about an area of 100 feet by 50 feet. And what you see here is every 10 by five feet, we put in a research plot. And one of the big things, because I've been a part of this and in, in yeah. the discussions, we wanted to make sure that this was something that was homeowner friendly. So we're not yes. using products or materials that a homeowner can't get at a box store or either online or something like that. That's right, such a common question, you know, hey, I want to get rid of Bermuda grass, I want to put in a vegetable garden or mm -hmm. a landscape bed, whatever it may be. How can I do that? But also, how can I do that if I didn't want to use glyphosate or, or a herbicide? So that's what this is. We have, well, we have glyphosate here to test against, but we have numerous treatments uh, that are organic, OMRI-listed type products. Some are just all natural. But the neat thing about it is you can go find these on the, sh you can go a mile or two down the road and find these on the shelves at your local store. That's excellent. And you'll notice that on the north side, we've got some spottiness that's more chemical treatment. Yeah. And then on the south side, it looks like we're doing more mechanical treatments. That's right. So we have a chemical portion of this trial and a non-chemical portion. So we have cardboard and solarization, and we also have mulch, and then we have combinations of tillage plus cardboard plus mulch and everything and in between. So. Okay, so if I was going to do this, I was just going to put some plastic and do the traditional uh, yeah. solarization. Yeah. So we've got some students out here and tell us a little bit of what really makes this true research. So what's really neat about this is, is uh, we're not just going to come out here and evaluate and see what happens with our eyes, but we're going to use some scientific instruments to do that too. So we'll actually collect data. Uh, what we have right now, some students looking at some photographs. They're use a light box to take a photo. So the box has lights inside of it. You put it over the plot so all the conditions are the same. The lighting is always the same on every picture, every plot. 
snap a photo, take it back to the lab, analyze for green versus brown pixels. We'll see how much control we have in this Bermuda grass. Excellent. Well, this has only endured one treatment, one spray application. We've got our mechanical applications down. Um, and there's more to come with that, cover crops and things like that also. Well, we ha we'll have it all going on. So this is really a 12-month process, and that's another part of the education is like, hey, you want to get rid of Bermuda grass? You really can't just do it with one treatment right. or a few weeks. It takes a little time. So yeah. we'll demonstrate that. All right. Well, stay tuned, everyone, because there's going to be a lot of segments that come out of this and a lot of information. And thank you for turning that simple question into some real answers that we can use. Right. We look forward to you to, uh, laying some mulch in the spring for us. All thank right. So we'll much. do it. <laughs>
and uh, just uh, various other things. Well, I like the double decker where you've kind of put a board on top of another board to hold two layers of tools there. Yeah, it, it, uh, it works well. That way I don't have to spend uh, a lot of time uh, finding stuff. Yeah, yeah, everything's out there in the open for you. Yeah, everything's out in the open for me, so. Well, let's talk a little bit. Uh, you have a beautiful lace bark elm here, which gives you a nice little shade garden, it looks like, that yeah. starting to be more of a shade garden anyway, yeah. right? Yeah, it didn't start out to be that way. It, uh, that tree has really grown and done well. I think it's probably been there about six years, seven years, so it's yeah. really grown well, and and I have to keep pruning it to keep keep it out of my roofs, but I I like the effect that it that it gives back here. I think it looks pretty nice myself. Yeah. But. yeah. But even better than that, I see a tree that is calling my name over here. You've got this beautiful peach tree that, I mean, it's loaded with peaches. Well, yeah, I, 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 we enjoy fresh fruit. And you, when you go to the grocery store, the stuff that's been picked uh, two or three weeks before it's ripe, uh, we, we prefer to have it fresh off the tree. Right. And so this has worked out nice. and. And I don't have to mow the lawn, and and uh, back here, it it, uh, it works it works well. Yeah, I, it seems like you found a little microclimate for your your orchard here. <laughs> You're right between two houses, a lot of concrete around us. Yeah, and, and they seem to be doing well. You've got another. I've got an apricot tree started there, and another column or apple. Okay. Uh, that uh, I had one, but I it wouldn't grow, so I I took it out. And put in an, and ordered a new columnar apple, and it's uh, it seems to be doing good. That's its second year here. So, and then I've got a columnar apple in the front. That's about its fourth year. Oh wow! And uh, and and it's doing really well. So. Okay. Um, so what do you think is a tribute to having all of this heavy fruit on this tree this year? Well, we had some late freezes. Well, I I. Uh, I uh, whenever I get a night that is going to be cold, I put a. Uh, I've got a big umbrella I put over it, and then I take a heat lamp and plug it in and, and try to keep it from freezing, and it seems to have worked. I've done it for three or four years now. Yeah, definitely. And, and, uh, and every year we get peaches off of it, so I'm happy about that. And it's broke. It, with the surroundings here, it, the, the tree doesn't break off bad. Okay. Uh, we don't get much wind on it, so it, it helps it a lot. Well, I would keep protecting it any time you get those late frosts because it's definitely worth it this time of year, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, we're, we're looking forward to, to, to eating some peaches. I, I'm just a week or two early, aren't I? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm sure you can find one or, or, or some that you can take with you. Charles, thank you so much. This has just been great, and we appreciate you sharing your backyard with us. Well, thank you very much. talk about a phenomenon that you might see happening in your lawn. It's not really a phenomenon, is it? It's uh, Dr. Moss is joining us to tell us a little bit about this unique pattern that we see this time of year in our Bermuda grass. Yeah, fall is here. The uh, nights get a little bit cooler and sometimes we'll get a frost, heavy frost that come through. Maybe warm up the next day, maybe the 80s the next day. Who knows, right? right? But then you welcome go out, to Oklahoma. Welcome to Oklahoma. <laughs> you go out in the lawn and you see all these weird stripes and you think, oh my goodness, do I have like army worms or do I have, what is this? Yeah. Well, it's just frost damage is all it is. So we got cool. Uh, some of those uh, frost patterns came out on the grass and, and uh, basically just froze it off. And then there you go. You've got some dead leaf material and some alive leaf material. So it always makes kind of this wavy pattern, right? It does. It's very interesting. Actually, one of our professors here at Oklahoma State, Dr. Dennis Martin, really studied this issue. And he's, he worked with like some physics professors and everybody. And they have a paper on this. Oh, really? It's very interesting how this happens. Maybe a little bit too much for us to cover <laughs> today. But basically, yeah, what you have is that, that frost comes in in a wave. You come out and some people call this tiger striping. It's oh, okay. like stripes from a tiger uh -huh. or something. It'll, if you come out like the next morning, it actually looks kind of black or gray. It's not brown yet. Okay. So you kind of see like these weird black spots or gray spots in the lawn come out in another day or two, and this is what you get. So basically that black that you're seeing is that plant tissue that's starting to die already. That's exactly right. Why does it do this in a wave? 
hey, talk to Dr. Dennis Martin. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what you get. Uh, nothing to worry about, no big problems. Uh, pretty soon it's probably gonna get a hard frost and then the whole yard's gonna do this for a Bermuda lawn. All right, so basically the warm season grasses are just getting ready to go to sleep into hibernation. That's right, time for bed. All right, thank you, Dr. Moss. Thank you. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, we visit the new Scissortail Park in Oklahoma City. We begin an exciting tour of Oklahoma school gardens that are part of the curriculum with visits to Madison Elementary in Norman and Riverfield School in Tulsa. And we make another stop on our tour of Italy with a primer on pasta. We hope you join us then for more TV you'll grow to love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.